few words about Augustine. Augustine has had a very interesting journey, especially after over the uh, last few years. Um, and um, he's uh, uh, an ordinand, a seminarian at present, and um, a theologian. He won the Church Times Theology Slam of 2020 uh, last year and was back there on the judging panel this year. And um, is a really interesting new voice in theology and church life in the UK. So I'm going to hand over to Augustine. Um, if uh, you want, are you happy with sharing screen and all that sort of stuff? You're going to manage the presentation? Yeah, brilliant. Okay, Augustine, take it away. Could we just ask everybody to mute themselves again? Great. Um, can you can you pray for us before I begin? Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us in this journey of Lent. Um, we give thanks for the ways in which we've met God and grown in our spiritual journey. And as we approach Passion Tide, we pray that you convict us with your truth and the truth that we should see in your world and the truth that Jesus stood up for in these final days. We pray for Augustine now as he presents to us that your spirit be upon him and guide us in our thoughts and our conversation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hopefully this will work, everyone. Um, I'm not a pro at this exactly, but is it working? It is working. Oh, it is. It's okay. flashing a bit, but. Oh, it's yeah. flashing. Okay. It's good now. It's good now. Okay. Weird. Okay. Um, if this is, oh goodness. This is so interesting. Forgive me, everyone. Uh, I'm trying to move the slides and it won't move. Maybe. Can you see that now? Yes, you're in the Apostles' Creed. Great. If we, just before we begin, I would love to um, say something that we can all agree on, um, no matter what uh, um, churchmanship tradition we come from, we can say this. So obviously you don't have to, you can keep yourself muted, but let's say the Apostles' Creed together to begin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffer under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Just a little bit about me really quickly um, to give you some context of what, who am I and stuff like that. Um, I was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. I was raised into a Jehovah's Witness family where we actually called our religion the truth. So outside of Jehovah's Witnesses, you call it JW or Jehovah's Witnesses or Witnesses, but we actually call it the truth. So that tells you something about me growing up and what that means, the like truth is. I first heard the gospel through the ministry of the Salvation Army, going to like a um, kind of like a Sunday school kind of thing when I was a kid. And then um, I would say that I had made a profession of faith um, in this Sims of God, which is like a Pentecostal um, denomination. But then later um, in my uh, adolescence, I started going to um, this uh, Catholic, this Roman Catholic um, youth group, and I just fell in love with the 
the the liturgy, but also the sacraments and also the saints, even though I was a radical Pentecostal. So I was like, this is really interesting. Um, and um, definitely looked into the priesthood in that way. Going over to university, I went to when I went to university, um, the United Methodist Church um, is the largest Protestant denomination in America. And they were planting new church expressions. And I was like, this is really amazing. And I got really involved in the United Methodist Church in America um, and um, was a liturgist. So I led uh, Methodist services and things like that. Um, but then I eventually was confirmed in the Church of England um, about seven years ago and um, became um, an Anglican, um, but very ecumenical. Uh, my adopted parents are Roman Catholic. Um, and um, so it, the Roman Catholic kind of tradition still stays with me, as well as the Methodist and Anglican. So I'm a, a mix of all of those, if that makes sense. So I've learned to, um, to see all the different expressions and find um, joy and truth in all of them. So <clears throat> I've asked a couple questions. And if you have a pen and paper, this would be absolutely amazing if you do. Or if you're on a computer and you have like a document, you can write it down. And this is just to gauge the room, to gauge where you are at when it comes to what is truth to you. So these are agree or disagree. So I'll give you a couple seconds to get a pen and paper or write on um, a Word document some of these. There's only about five questions, but it helps you understand what you believe is truth um, and things like that when it comes to our faith. So I'll give you about 10 seconds to do that, to get, to get a pen and paper or a Word document. Okay, <clears throat> the first, first question, agree or disagree? We tend to have a restricted view of the word as, it, as if knowledge only applies to the realm of empirical evidence. That's a, big, that's, a, that's a big statement, so let me just read it one more time. We tend to have a restricted view of the word as if knowledge only applies to the realm of empirical evidence. Do you agree or disagree with that statement? Disagree. How would you like <laughs> us to respond? You can, you uh, like write, you can write it down, write it down okay. on the pen and paper. Okay, next question. Truth can be found within the, within the, oh, sorry, that, that statement doesn't make completely sense, but truth can be found only within Christian scriptures. Um, and I have no idea why it says that college on the bottom. I try to get rid of it, but um, I'm not very technological. Um, but yeah, so truth can only be found within Christian scriptures. So the only truth that we can find is within the Bible. Next question. Truth can only be found within Christian, within church teachings. So if you're a Methodist, if you're an Anglican, if you're a Roman Catholic, um, if you identify something else, it can only be found within, within our understanding of our church's teachings. So that could be, you know, Catholic churches in small c, worldwide church, or that can even be um, Catholic, as in large C, Roman Catholic, or Anglican, or Methodist tradition. Agree or disagree? Experience is a source of authoritative truth. Experience is a source of authoritative truth.
five more seconds. And last question. Truth is discovered, not created. Truth is discovered, not created. Now, I know these are binary. Some people are like, well, kind of, but you have to pick one, agree or disagree. Truth is discovered, not created. Okay, so keep those for our discussion a little later. One thing that's really important about understanding truth, and not just a philosophical understanding of truth, but within the church's understanding of truth, is we have a divide between the East and the West way of thinking. And this is one thing I, I made, Western versus Eastern thinking. You know, so, so for instance, you know, love for people in East love is silent um and for the west you first have to love someone and then you marry them where it might be different love is vocal in the west you say i love you um whether love is more in what you do for someone um you know live in time and then um, live in space in the west so it's those difference understanding of how we view things and this is helps us to understand what do we mean when we mean um truth and it's really important to come to, at it with saying actually we're coming to understanding truth you're understanding the church within our context and our context our cultural context um, for most of us who live in the west who have western education western thinking that's really important to figure out um what that means what truth means and also and one of the things that we looked at as well This is something I, I found as well that's really quite interesting. So, um, and this is what I mean by these different understandings of the same thing. So you see um, a woman who is, a, looks Western woman, um, everything is covered but her eyes. What a cruel male dominated culture. That's what this Western woman is seeing to this, um, to this woman who looks like she's from the Middle East, from a um, um, Arab speaking country. But then, the, Arab speaking lady says nothing covered but her eyes. What a cruel male dominated um, culture. So it's, it's, it's that same thing, that same looking at um, different ways of looking and the understanding of how we have different perspectives. So we've acknowledged that, you know, the East and the West, different people, different traditions, we come to the word truth differently. Now, something that happened recently for the West is this understanding of alternative truth. And I think, unfortunately, my president in the United States have helped create this, um, this idea of alternative truth. And we can look at it in a philosophical way. Um, and we can look at what Paul was saying, um, sorry, what Jesus was saying um, in the Gospels, what truth was. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But what does that mean for outside of just understanding, you know, Jesus? Well, I will put my cards on the table and say that the Latin American um, Roman Catholic liberation theology kind of forms my understanding of truth, as well as John Wesley's kind of idea of, um, of experience being a understanding a framework of understanding truth but as well as this Anglican kind of in the middle trying to balance Protestantism over here and Roman Catholicism over here. And I think in the last few years, I think for me, this is what things been really important about truth. And I say that I have this here, this advertisement, you know, prophets and prophets. And as I read the Christian scripture, um, I see over and over what truth means in the church is sometimes 
telling the church where it has gone wrong. And also when when you tell the church or organization when they've got wrong, prophets usually does not grow as <laughs> it doesn't grow. The prophets of the Old Testament um, continued, continued over and over to tell the people of God what they were getting wrong. The the Christian church in the early first century Judaism, um, as it was establishing, people thought it was this cult. And people over and over continued to try to figure out what are these issues? You know, should the, should the um, Gentiles be circumcised like the Jews? Can we eat food that's been, you know, um, offered to idols? And it's this huge understanding of what is truth. And that's what this culture and this truth understanding is what Paul and what the New Testament is over and over and over and over getting about this cultural class of how do we do this together? How do we live together? How do we practice the way? And that is what really is confusing. And again, I say these prophets over a prophet. And this prophetic voice that I think God is calling us to live in the truth is to understand experience in the light of the gospel, understanding this experience in light of what the church is actually doing. For me, the truth is Jesus. The truth is from the Christian scriptures. It is from church tradition, but it is from human understanding and human experience. I do hold the, the biblical story um, as authoritative. I do. I love scripture. And I love the tradition of the saints. I love being able to share my faith with other people. But also, I'm very much aware that our experiences in life has to be lit up by, illuminated, I would say, by the holy scriptures. Yesterday, we, we celebrated, um, hopefully you celebrated, um, um, Oscar M uh, Romero. And he, is, he was a Latin American um, priest, and he's kind of the, one of the fathers of liberation theology. And one of the things that he was trying to do is he was trying to understand, how do I preach the gospel to people in these absolute squalor places in Latin America um, with this, these dictators um, kind of honing into what we're trying to do? And he kind of developed this understanding of liberation theology, this understanding that the gospel is for the marginalized people of the earth. And he went, he really, really tried to establish this understanding and he lived this life and his fellow priests lived this life that established an understanding and a narrative of the gospel of Jesus Christ that was for all people, regardless of your creed. And he was a prophet and he got persecuted for, for it. He was not invited to several things because of these um, these notions, what he felt that how we improve people's lives through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think we have those prophets today. And I think the church, as it is a prophetic voice to um, from God to his people, God is speaking to the church today and what truth is. And it's saying, live the truth that I have given you in light of the experience of Jesus. Now, like a good Anglican, I won't give all the answers because <laughs> I don't have all the answers. That's the beautiful thing about being Anglican. But it's giving you resources and helping you think about what does truth look like in light of what the church says and how do you go... Um, and face the community in which we love and we care about. Before we have questions, I will leave this quote. My favorite saint, um, who my namesake, Saint Augustine, um, he says this, 
a person who is a good and true Christian should realize that truth belongs to the Lord. Whatever it is found, gathering and acknowledging it, even in pagan literature, but rejecting superstitious vanities and deploring and avoiding those who throw they knew God did not glorify him as God. St. Augustine famously said, all truth is God's truth. I think Calvin said it and also Aquinas said it. And that's kind of where I want to leave um, with this kind of presentation today is I kind of believe that if it is true, it's from God. And we have this kind of expression today in the modern world that people say, live your truth. And I would probably argue that the tr your truth isn't your truth, but it's the truth. And maybe that sounds quite blatantly conservative, but I think there is some um, black and white areas of the truth um, and how you look at it as well. So maybe that confused you even more. Maybe you um, really liked it. But, um, but yeah, now we can open it up to some questions. Okay. Um, if anyone would like to um, to to drop some some uh, questions in the chat, that'd be great. Um, on any issues between pertaining to the truth and how we see it and how truth is in the church, that'd be really useful. Um, if I can just start, perhaps by asking one question um, on your experience. Um, you mentioned about liberation theology. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a growing sense uh, today and actually over the last year, what one thing that the crisis has really brought out is that there is there is this great disparity um, in in wealth in our society. Um, and and I wonder what is the church? What do you think should the church be doing and saying about this at the moment? Yeah, I think, you know, um, I'm actually writing about this tomorrow. Um, as you know, one of the biggest issues we have is housing in the UK. Um, and as a person, and I'll be honest, as a person who um, I grew up, um, part of my story, I grew up in homeless shelters most of my childhood from six to about 17. So most of my life I knew as a homeless shelter. So and none, no one in my entire family has ever owned a house. So I'll be honest, when people talk about home ownership, I'm like, oh, I just I just never thought about that. I just, we just rent it you know, our whole life, um, which is good because I'm gonna be a clergy person, which means I'm never gonna own a house anyway. So it's good. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think people are realizing that how do we use our resources that God has given us to bless other people? Um, you know, there is, I think, in light of liberation theology and especially the poor and the marginalized, here's a, here's a, here's a, here's a big bombshell. So forgive me, father. But, um, you know, people often argue that for the church to be a prophetic voice to the marginalized and people, it can't be with the state. Um, so for the Anglicans among us, that's really quite, inf that's quite interesting. Um, because they said that you can't be in bed with the state in order to be a prophetic voice against the state. Um, but I think one thing with the, with the pandemic is that we're understanding is, um, you know, churches love thy neighbor stuff that has been really doing, has been really great. It's been really fascinating to see what um, different churches and communities have done. Um, so I think we just kept keeping actually the church. <laughs> I think that's um, kind of, what I'm thinking, yeah, yeah. I I, I get very disappointed because I in the media, like I feel like the Church of England has had a really rough time, and I know of so many churches, like through different people, who are doing amazing things, and it it doesn't get out there in the way I I think it it, it should. But people, with, yeah. Like, so bad story, don't they? Especially my parish, my parish that I've worked at for the last two years, um, is in the west end of Newcastle. 
And um, we are at, at the time we we're before the pandemic, we were the biggest food bank uh, in the country. Um, and um, at first I felt like we were like a food bank with a service rather than a church with a food bank. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we were kind of complaining about is we don't have enough food to feed people, turning people away, which is, to be honest, really, really hard to turn people away who like we have no food. Um, and it just made it ma way bigger, a huge deal, even at, during the pandemic. So, um, but yeah, they do such great work, but people just don't really know about it. So, yeah. yeah. I'm going to ask John Whitaker uh, to, to ask his question or to rephrase a question. Yeah. Oh, you want me to, you want John to ask it or you want me to just answer it? Oh, no, no, John can speak. Unless... Okay. Thanks, Augustine, for the talk. Um, I guess um, lots of us became aware of your name when it was on the front page for Church Times and indeed quite a lot of media because of quite a brutal encounter um, of racism quite embedded within the Church of England or, or a part of the Church of England. Um, and it just having heard you and been very inspired by you and you're clearly still so passionate in your love for truth in church and <laughs> faith and yet you had that bruising experience not everyone will know what that experience was I, I wondered whether you might be willing to share it and then just say a little bit about how you've moved on and still perhaps have faith that there is truth to be encountered within uh within church yeah, thank you, John. Yeah, I think you know, I, I'm actually writing a book about this, actually, not about the situation, but about just certain things. Um, so um, uh, February 2020, um, the, actually my birthday, my 30th birthday, um, I got a, a letter from uh, a place I applied to be a curate at. Um, so, um, you know, being a trainee vicar um, in the Church of England, and it was in Hertfordshire, and uh, it was a white working class um, parish. And they felt that because I was black that it, I wouldn't um, feel comfortable there. Therefore, they're going to stop all conversations. Um, and they never actually had any conversation with me. It was just email back and forth. And they said I would feel uncomfortable there. Um, uh, now, I'm adopted to white working class people. Um, at the time, I had a partner who was white working class. And and all due respect, I, did, I just chose to go to seminary and the northeast of England, which isn't known for being its most multicultural and affluent area of the country. So I was quite confused. Um, um, and my other parishes have been in inner city Liverpool and Toxeth um, and a council state in Dorset. And then, uh, um, and uh, um, oh yeah, in the, in the east end of London. So <laughs> most of my place has actually been pretty, um, and that's been, and that was really, really difficult. Um, and I decided not to um, go public with it because basically I have, because I so desire for people to know and love the person of Jesus Christ. So therefore, I don't. I anytime something bad happened, my experience happened. I didn't want to say publicly about it because I didn't want then people to be turned off from Christ if they were turned off from the church. Um, but then when the Church of England kind of said, "Oh, we believe Black Lives Matter," is I was like, "I can't do this anymore," and that's when I decided to post it in June. Um, and that was a really, you know, re it was a really kind of hurtful because actually what happened during that is I was not given a, a curacy. They knew about it and they said, we're really sorry about that, but nothing actually happened. Um, it was just a email. I'm really sorry that, that hurt you, um, which as we all know, um, those aren't actually, that's not an actual apology, <laughs> but I'm sorry you felt that way. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a non-apology. Um, and uh, if I'm honest, being very honest with you, John, you know, I was, you know, obviously you finish theological college, you go into a cure, so you have a house, you have, that's what you kind of plan on doing. Um, that is not really what happened. Obviously, I was like, okay, in this middle of pandemic, what do I do? Um, so, you know, amazingly, my non-Christian friends are the ones that showed me the the arm, the arms of Christ and let me, you know, live with them. Um, and that's, and it's been my, and I've, you know, have made an income through, um, the BBC actually, <laughs> you know, presenting, presenting things to the BBC. So it's something I never, ever thought was going to happen as well in writing for writing for things as well. So, yeah. So I think what it is, is for me, um, I, I, I experienced um, kind of a little bit, I decided not to go into it. I was going to go into it tonight, but I said, actually it's quite triggering for some people if someone's been with it. But 
um, and I'm, I'm fortunate, I'm just speaking about the Church of England, uh, um, but there's loads of in the Methodist and the Roman Catholic Church, but um, I was a, a, you know, I experienced abuse from a priest um, uh, while I've been in the UK, and it was really, really difficult. Um, and I think for me, and people will say, wait, why are you, like, why are you still a part of the church? Why are you still a part of um, faith? And I, and I said, that I have to separate and this is going to be really hard for people who have a high view of the sacraments, but I have to sa- I have to separate my faith and the church. Um, otherwise, I think that it, it, my faith will go. Um, so, um, so I think that's kind of where it's been. Um, but I have such a love and care for the person of Jesus Christ that transforms lives and cultures everywhere um, that can never be quenched, really. Um, so, um, and my, in my experience as a church has not been very positive, <laughs> you know, for, so for the, you know, I've been in the UK since 2013 and I have worked for the church voluntarily, um, as an intern and stuff, but I never got paid. I, I haven't been, I, you know, I haven't been like paid to, to work for it. I haven't been paid since I lived in England, um, which is crazy, but that's how much I care about the church. I really want to be a part of it and serve in an ordained, um, situation. So, um. So yeah, sorry, that was a long, long explanation, but yeah. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, yeah, it's in a way it's hard not to, to go into more of that, but um, yeah, I, I, don't, uh, I don't want to make this sort of too personal for you as well, because um, yeah. But um, Tommy has asked um, those questions that you raised at the beginning of your talk. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Perhaps you could just say a little bit more about them. And, yeah, uh, yeah, no, that's fine. That's yeah. fine. Uh, I didn't want to. I didn't want someone. To, I didn't. I didn't want it to be like a massive um, argument. Obviously, if we were in person, then it would, I would have done it in a slightly different way. Yeah, but um, it's difficult. Yeah, that. I think so. Those so those questions were um, partly came up by me, and also through um, some philosophical and psychological theological thought, and basically. Um, the reason why I picked those questions and I can share my answers is because the way you view faith and way you view truth is, is going to help you understand um, the way people function. I think that's really, really important. So when I asked um, if I can put this up to the side really quick, Double screen my side. Um, so when I said, uh, men are never good at multicasting. Um, agree or disagree. Truth <laughs> is discovered, not created. Um, now, I think that's a, re- I mean, that's a really poignant question. <laughs> a deep question. I think some people might be like, what does that even mean? And I, I, I that's that could be a dissertation right there. Um, but if you believe that truth can be created rather than discovered, then that's going to. So the, some of the, your views of the church's teachings and what they have done is going to really impact that. So, for instance, if you have a view that um, or say, for instance, you know, um, experience is a source of authoritative truth. So, you know, one of the big things that we've have experienced recently, um, um, you know, my, my adopted parents and grandparents are really quite strong Roman Catholics. And um, my parents and grandparents differ on the views of, you know, um, same-sex relationships and marriage. And my parents have more progressive, my grandparents have more um, traditional, which you could probably just guess, that, <laughs> guess about that. Um, and my parents' experience is based upon my father's having um, uh, a best friend who uh, has this partner who he loves has been with and they're Roman Catholic and wants to see them see it um, blessed in a, in a church. Um, so, so for my father, that experience of being with his best friend and his partner outweighs what for him, what the church's teaching is. And I think that and understanding the truth and what that looks like is going to really figure, like really help you understand so for, for instance, for me, I would say experience is a source of 
truth, but for me, it's not the authoritative truth, um, without a doubt. That's that's what I would say. Um, as well as truth can only be found within Christian teachings, I would probably say obviously no, because um, I, I, my first degree is in um, international agriculture and agronomy, um, which is really random because I'm a city person, but I decided to do an agriculture degree and I was a missionary in Mozambique. That's a whole nother story. But, um, but obviously I believe in, I believe in science um, in some ways like that. Truth can only be found within the Christian scriptures. And obviously I believe that that can be different. Um, and I do believe that we, we do tend to have a restricted view um, of the word as if knowledge only applies to the realm of empirical investigation. I do believe as a world, we do, we do do that. So, yeah. Yeah, do you think there's, I mean, because the Anglican tradition has sort of held um, scripture, the creeds, um, experience, um, these different elements together. And and I suppose has the sense that the spirit is with us to lead us into truth. Um, I wonder if, if, if you had any thought on how, how do you navigate that path in terms of um, perhaps being more socially liberal, but retaining a sense of a fairly conservative theology. Um, you know, how do we how do we steer that path in the church to take what is that the relevance of our experience and and to um, to marry that with um, with what we have in the Bible and also what science is telling us, for example. Yeah, I th- I mean I think that's really you know so you know one thing um, for those who are Methodist. You know, I was a part of the United Methodist Church, and I, you know, I still, when I go back to the States, I still go to that church. The United Methodist Church is unfortunately right now um, uh, splitting in two, to two Methodist denominations, which is really, really difficult for a lot of people. Um, and it's mostly over experience and only the traditional understanding of scripture. I mean, this is what it is. Um, and splits, and often splits like this happens all the time. Um and that's been really, really difficult to see. Um, and I think as it comes to having a more fairly traditional lens of church tradition and scripture uh, and worldwide, I think it's just, I think it's just really hard. I don't even know how to answer that really. <laughs> um, I think, um, you know, for me going, becoming Anglican was, um, I often say that I was on the road to Canterbury from Chicago, but uh, on the road to um, Rome, but only had enough money um, to get to Canterbury. Um, And, um, and like, basically like, Hey, I can't, I can't swim. I can't go that much further. Um, So um, I can't go to the continent. And, um, and for me, like this, the truth of the, you know, the lower C Catholic church is really important. And how do we do this in unity? I think it's really, really difficult. And um, I would say, you know, there is a, there is this, I think there is this beauty of this generally unchanging truth that Roman Catholicism gives you that, you know, there isn't, if you split away, it's, it's not going to be two Roman Catholic churches. There's just one Roman Catholic church um, that I think Anglicanism and Methodism doesn't have. Um, and there's some beauty of that black and whiteness that is attached to the tradition. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to switch to Rosemary. I don't know if you're happy to unmute yourself, Rosemary, and ask, ask you a question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have to read it out. Um, yes. Do you think that truth is something which can be grasped in entirety by any one human being in time? Or do you think, as I do, that the discovery of truth is a lifetime work in progress, which we can only grasp through dialogue with other people committed to trying to discover it through Christ? And maybe not through Christ also, perhaps. Yeah. Um, I... D- it's interesting. I think it is a, I agree with you. I mean, I, 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 I say I agree. <laughs> yes, sister. Um, I think it is this lifelong understanding, you know, it is, you know, I'm only 31 years old um, and I'm, st- and I'm, and I'm still being corrected about things that I believe that was true, that wasn't actually true. Um, 
you know, so it gives you a little some insight. One of the hardest things I think for my, um, so my grandparents are um, uh, immigrants from um, Sweden, um, moved here when they were in their 20s and now they're in their 80s. Um, but the, they, they, they don't really like that they have, you know, black and Hispanic grandchildren, um, if I'm being honest, they don't. And they, they did look at it as kind of a, a lesser thing to have non-white um, grandchildren. And my grandfather, a little bit more faster than my grandmother, has seen that his truth is actually wrong. <laughs> Um, and um, I say amen to that to my grandfather. Um, but um, but yeah, and, I, and but I, I think that, and we're all like seeing. So one of the really hard things for me as well um, is, you know, when I got adopted to this family, um, you know, my 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 mother doesn't spank her children. My adopted mother. Um, African American community seems, and actually, and probably Afro Caribbean in, in Britain would find that very strange that you don't spank your kids. Um, and I was just like livid. I was like, oh my goodness, like, to, like, not even say you're being a bad mother because that's obviously ridiculous. Um, but I, I was just like, I don't think that's very good parenting. Well, then I had to see the research and the psychological research and saying actually spanking your kid or kids isn't healthy for them. Well, I could, I could do two things. I could go and say, well, I don't really care what psychology thinks. I think this is right. This is my, from my experience, this is what it is. Because this is what my cultural understanding says. And that's that really, and it was really, really, really hard for me to go, yeah, I'm wrong. Um, so I think, I do think it's a lifetime of understanding. And I think that we only get a glimpse of it. <laughs> you know, I, and I, I do see, I do think that a lot of things are a lot of things are a lot more gray than black and white than I thought. Thank you. Yeah. If I can, if I can draw you back to the question of the church, like possibly the, um, the most, like I think the di most difficult question that particularly the Church of England faces, um, the Anglican communion faces in a way is in a way it's related to what you talk about in terms of being prophetic um, and also what the Anglican Church has its sort of basis in of being inclusive. So obviously the Anglican Church, it almost starts as, or the Church of England, sorry, uh, starts as really a Calvinist sort of church, but it has all these Catholic elements and it becomes very broad. So we have the church we see today, which ranges from, I don't know, um, yeah, from, from liberal to high church to to very Catholic to um, charismatic, everything else. Um, we have a very inclusive church in the Church of England. Um, but then there is also the sense in which we want to speak prophetically. Um, and so just to give you as an example, as the thing I think is one of the most difficult things is um, in general, there is a, a more progressive liberal attitude, certainly in Britain and America, and it would want that to speak that to other parts of the world in which we see intolerance. Um, but at the same time, we're very aware of our cultural heritage, and that makes it very difficult. So, so as an example, what should the church be teaching in terms of how should it be speaking to its brothers and sisters in what's called the Southern Cone in, um, in Africa, in Australia. Um, and do we speak what we think is the truth or do we, do we focus on keeping everyone together? Any thoughts about that? that? That's a great question because my, uh, my doctorate is on post-colonialism. So <laughs> within, within the Anglican system. Um, Western Christians, we have, Western people, we have absolutely shot ourselves in the foot <laughs> because um, because of colonialism we you know many of the british colonies has still old british rules attached to it so for instance um so sodomy rules you know um you still aren't allowed to have um that kind of sex because of the old british rules so we taught these to people 
<laughs> we taught people how to exegete scripture. We taught people how to do all these things. And then we have said, actually, we look back into the scripture and actually we may be wrong or this is how you do things. And now we don't, we can't really, it's hard to go and say, actually, you're doing that wrong when that's the, these are the people that taught you. Um, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's very similar. It, I think it's, I see it almost in the sense of, you know, you, um, your parents teach you something as a child. And then now you're an adult. They say, actually, don't do any of that that I just ta I taught you. And you're like, wait, but this is foundational in what you told me this is about. So I think it's really hard. Um, I think especially when it comes to the more progressive, uh, for me, when it comes to more of the progressive theological things, um, at least within the Anglican communion, is um, questions of like same-sex marriage and things like that. And I get why so many people so desire to um, allow those, at least the Church of England to have same-sex marriage and the Methodist Church is going there as well. But I think for our brothers and sisters who's in, this, in the global South, who, you know, especially like, let's say for instance, Nigeria, who people are killed by Boko Haram and things like that for being a Christian. And because the Church of England is the mother church, when the Church of England does stuff, other, or England does stuff, other people do react to it. You know, so for instance, the, the, you know, the, Anglican, the Episcopal Church of Sudan, they changed their name to the Anglican Church of Sudan. It's the same thing, same denomination, they changed the name. And the reason why they changed the name is because if they say Episcopal, then people think they are associated with the U.S. and Scotland, which allows same-sex marriage. And these are people who are trying to be Christians in Muslim-dominated places that are being killed for their faith. Um, so it, uh, it is really, really difficult um, with the inclusion. So I don't know. I don't know how we go at it uh, because we have we have done – we, we have done really bad things in the past, but I would say in the same way that we should then be conscious, the more progressive, progressive people, we need to be conscious of the global South and the context in which they live in. So as you, as you I, I don't know if you know, if you're into the Anglican world, most people aren't because it's kind of boring. But it's um you know one of the one of the archbishops said that you know homosexuality is a disease. Um, he said that recently. He said it's a disease that we need to stamp out, um, which is quite offensive. You know, and, and that's not what Anglicans believe. We don't believe it's a disease. And like how to, and and he has to if he went soft on it, then he actually might be killed. And in Africa, there has been bishops who um, there's a bishop who was um, kidnapped and killed. For being a Christian, um, so I de so I definitely have, you know, um, you know I'm an, I'm an openly gay man myself, um, and I definitely have that um, fervor and like that love for inclusivity. But I also understand that actually, you know, homosexuality is illegal in 79 countries, and most in communion, it's even illegal. So we're thinking about same-sex marriage; it's not even legal to be in a relationship with someone of the same sex. So it's that. It's that balance. How, what does unity look like? And I don't think unity looks like uniformity. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I think we have to remember as well that um, it was only decriminalized in parts of the United Kingdom in the 80s. So, you know, okay, it's an agenda that's moved very, very quickly in Europe, but not necessarily elsewhere. Um, quick extra question. Do you think there's a difference in attitudes to truth between America and the UK? Mm. Funny, because America is so, like, it's great. I was an army chaplain for five years. I went to America. Like, you couldn't be more golden to be in the army and to be a pastor. Like, everyone oh, yeah. Loves you. <laughs> yeah. In the UK, people are very suspicious about the army 
and they'd rather just ignore the church and pretend it didn't exist a lot of the time. So it, it, it's really funny, the cultural differences between the United Kingdom and America and the church is certainly one of the kind of more extreme parts of that. So I, I wondered if in your reflections on truth, you think that there is there is much of a difference in how we perceive it? Yes, I think massive. I think culturally, um, I think the U.S. again, um, Americans are emotional people. You know, we are we are very emotional people. Um, we don't have, we didn't we don't I didn't grow up with this idea that men don't cry, the stiff upper lip kind of thing. Um, most of my friends who I talk, oh, when's the last time you cried? They're like, oh, when I was in you know, year five. I'm like, you might need to go see a counselor because that's a problem. But um, but yeah, I didn't have I didn't have those things. We're really emotional people. So um, I think Americans, as much as they say they don't, do very very much live by their truth is their experience. Um, and I think that whole live your truth thing it comes from America. It came from a kind of Oprah kind of New Age kind of philosophical thing. Live your truth. Um, and I think in England. I can only speak in England because um, I haven't really been. I've been. I've been to all the four nations, but n not really extensively. But I think in England, English English people don't want to hold a view that isn't popular. If that makes sense. So, um, people would really, uh, you know, Americans would have no problem being like, you know, those. Islamists do it, you know, X, Y, Z. They have no problem. British people would at least think before they spoke. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a big, that's a big difference. English people do think before they speak most of the time. Americans uh, do and didn't think. Um, so I think that's a huge thing. Um, but, you know, and maybe, you know, for people who are older, um, I do think that there is some sometimes this confidence that when you get older, you can kind of say whatever you want. Um, uh, with no repercussions, <laughs> that's really quite, like a lot, lot nicer. Um, I was doing this project with um, some some youth, um, non-Christian youth, um, around the Northeast, and they're asking about anti-racism and things like that. And they said, "How? What do you think the number one thing for us to do?" And I said, um, "When Grandpa says something racist, you need to call him out on it." Now, these are northern people, right? So northern people, especially, um, they love, I mean, I think people in the south love their grandparents as well. As well but um, northern people have, a, I think, an affinity for their grandparents that's different than the south, that, you know, that's different than the south of England. And you telling your grandfather or grandmother that they're wrong, uh, like, that is, you know, that is like, I mean, that's crazy. That's crazy to think of. Um, but yeah, it's that it's but it's the understanding of truth and how do you do that? Um, and I think culturally is different um, across the Atlantic is different generationally as well. So um, yeah, I think it's just a lot of conversations. And I know it was really awkward, but a lot of family I know a lot of families in England would really really hate to have those awkward conversations. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, it was really really funny, really quick. I was um. One thing, you know, one thing I also realize is in the UK, you don't talk about money. You might say things are a lot or little, but those don't mean anything to anybody, right? Um, so um, I was at a friend's house, a family I really knew really well. And I said, uh, and they're getting married. I'm like, oh, so what is your budget for the wedding? Now, I, they're my best friends. I thought that was completely appropriate. Um, and the girl was like, you could tell she felt a little uncomfortable. Like, oh, goodness, what do I do? And she told me it was like, I think she told me it was like 30,000 um, pounds. And, uh, and I said something, again, being American and being an idiot. I said, wow, that's like the average wage in the UK. <laughs> but that's only for one day. Um, and then her parents were like, wait, what? You were planning on spending that much? Um, and it was, and unfortunately, I mean, I was never invited to their house ever again. But um, um, I learned something in ministry that night. So, um, so yeah, and it's that it's that like, how do you deal with those truths and um, and understanding as well, um, which has been oh, very very fascinating adventure for me. Yeah, 
speaking the truth in love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or sometimes being quiet and sometimes speaking up. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely a fact. British people are very poor at speaking about money, which then generally becomes terrible problems. So we would be better, much better off if we were able to talk about money. Well, we had a whole um, session at college about, you know, giving and stuff like that. And I was like, I don't understand why this is such a big deal. People were like, you don't, you don't get it. It's, um, it's I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I, was, I didn't know this was a big deal, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's super. Um, so before before we finish, one last little question, if I may. Just if you feel that, because I mean, one thing that again has come out, I think, in the last month for me is that people have there's been a lot more questions asked about the middle and the top of the church, um, mm. because there's been there's been a sort of slight disjunct in a way between parish ministry, which has been getting on with things, and the hierarchy is people like to talk about it. Um, but, you know, as someone who's coming through the system from, from, from below, as it were, um, as I mean, as a, as a seminarian uh, looking towards the curacy, um, is there a truth that you think that the church needs to take hold of, especially in its sort of structure and in terms of the overall peace? What, what is the truth that needs speaking to the church to, to change it so it can start being better. <laughs> mm. I think that we we love systems. Um, we're not we're not I mean we're not Germans. We're not as efficient with systems, but we like we love systems. Um, I also learn. I also know that in England you love um, reports. <laughs> Goodness, you love reports. <laughs> um, England loves reports and love. What is the thing the government always does? Lessons learned, um, like a thing. Um, they never really actually learn from it, but they um, but they like to make documents about it. Um, I think the the church, whether it be the Roman Catholic parish, the Anglican parish, the Methodist chapel church the heart of it is the people who are part of that community um most people don't care about all the other stuff <laughs> um you, you i mean i mean they don't really care i mean some people care what the archbishop of canterbury says on easter day um but for the most part people don't really care people want people want a, a priest that cares and loves for them um, and everything else should be helping people know and love Jesus and be pastorally cared about. And everything needs to be that, not into, you know, all these other random functions. That's what it's about. Cause at the heart of our faith is this Christian community that is a bunch of ragtag misfits that God wants to put it together it really is this beautiful table. Um, and I write a lot about the table, not just because it's Eucharistic, but because, you know, that's where we can all become equal is at the table. Um, and, you know, the Anglican liturgy, you know, I'm, I'm not worthy so much to gather up the crumbs under your table. Um, and we're all unworthy, but yet God still calls us friend. <laughs> that's so, I mean, that's so amazing. That the God of the universe that created heaven and earth came down and we are just so small, but yet he still calls us friend is amazing. And I think when we get to the nuts and bolts of ministry, it isn't Anglican Twitter or, you know, you know, what is happening in Rome with, you know, taking away 10% of, you know, the high up people, uh, which I think is a good thing in a way because it's sacrificial. Um, or even the, the Methodist church changing some of their, um, the way they govern things, but it's really trying to enable the local area. And I think that's really what it, I think that's really what it is. And I think the time should be spent at the local area without a doubt, not making more bishoprics and things like that. Um, yeah. Um, it's been really interesting because my best friend 
in the UK is um, um, he's definitely called to a Roman Catholic priesthood. He just doesn't know it yet. Um, um, I told him all the time, like, you can't get a girlfriend. I think that's another that's one calling of you're called to the Roman Catholic priesthood. Um, but uh, but yeah, he um, and we talked we chatted about this a lot about how do we grow the kingdom of God in that and um, and really it's enlightening people's faith um, without a doubt. So one one more thing I want to say. I said this at, at Synod, and people thought I was absolutely crazy. They said, if you can invest money in something, what would you invest in? <laughs> and they were thinking, because I'm like, I'm young, and I was going to say, like, this is kind of whatever. And um, I actually said, I would invest in equipping the seasoned saints of the church to share their faith with their family and friends. Because my experience in, in England, especially with young people, the next generation, is a lot of them have so much love and respect for their grandparents and, and older people that they listen to them. And what they say really matters. This pandemic has shown that people really, really miss their grandparents mm -hmm. dramatically. And what you believe and what you practice and what you say, maybe your maybe your kids didn't necessarily get it, but I think your grandpa your grandchildren are listening and they love you and they care for you and they want to know about how you lived your life. And you know, the that's the big I mean, literally, every time I talk to my friends, one of the things about the vaccine was not necessarily that, oh, you need to go to a pub, but I get to hug my grandmother, I get to hug my grandfather. That is it. And that's what I would, and even before the pandemic, I said, I want to equip senior, we say senior saints in the States, senior saints to, to um, proclaim their faith afresh to their family and friends. That, that's, that's what I would do. Hmm. That's lovely. That's, yeah, that's really thought provoking and challenging i think as well to it will be to a lot of people um but no it's a really good message thank you yeah um well on behalf of all of us it's been great to have you tonight um thank you so much for all you shared with us and for your honesty for your integrity